of looking at the signs of the times and my how they are going past at great speed. Things are happening which we've only dreamt about years ago, but now we are seeing as realities. So it is indeed an, a very exciting time that we're living in. And what I want to do this evening is to build upon where we got to at Prophecy Day at Rugby, uh, what, uh, eight months ago, and to see how things have moved on. We will have to go backwards, of course, and uh, to link on with past events and to look at scripture to give us our background. But in the main, what we're going to be dealing with is what's dealt with on the front cover of Milestones. And if anybody hasn't got a copy, I've got some spare copies here. But the first part of our talk will be covering uh, Brexit and the way that Europe is taking advantage of Brexit to bind itself together to uh, proceed to a United States of Europe. That's its destination. We know that from scripture and we know from the founding fathers that's what they planned right from the beginning. So we're spending quite a lot of time with that and then on the last part we shall be looking at Tarshish and Britain and how she is working with Israel. Now, there are lots of things we would love to cover, but this won't be time to look at Russia and Syria, to look at how the Arab states are um, encompassing Israel and uh, the southern Arab states, uh, to look at the bottom picture of Trump and the embassy, but we won't have time for that. So we've got a very full and packed evening. But I'm going to start off with, uh, I might think it's rather strange, why does so much seem to be going wrong? Uh, and we have Israel now having seemingly been in a very strong position with Russia and in Syria, is now faced with these S-300 missiles. Um, Brexit seems to be unravelling, doesn't it? It gets uh, worse as the days go by. And uh, following the, we assumed, murder of Khashoggi, uh, Saudi Arabia's relations with the West are unravelling. And yet we know from scripture that uh, Britain and America are strong players in Saudi Arabia. So there seems to be a setback in what's happening there. Uh, and again, one looks at the Roman Catholic Church, which has been growing in power, but at the moment seems to be unravelling over the problems with sexual abuse. And we've just, this last week, had the rift between the Russian Orthodox Church and the Greek Orthodox Church over the situation of the church in Ukraine. And Israel is facing threats from Hamas, and it's getting worse and worse. And yet, I believe that this is a time of testing for us. God's purpose is moving forward, but it doesn't move forward swiftly and smoothly. It has ebbs and flows. And so, for believers, we see so many things going in the right direction, and then they seem to be halting. But that's the test of our faith. God is in control. Israel... Uh, will be victorious, um, temporarily anyway, uh, against her foes. Uh, she will be overwhelmed when Go comes down with his armies. But up to that time, Israel will eventually dwell in a time of peace and safety. And um, Britain will finally leave and go her own course. We know that from scripture, from what we read. We know that Britain and the Young Lions will play their part in Saudi Arabia, the Sheba and Dedan area. We know that the Roman Catholic Church will bind Europe together and the two churches, East and West, will unite together to bring Daniel's image uh, against, uh, or Nebuchadnezzar's image, uh, against Israel. So, uh, and Israel will be victorious against Hamas because there have to be a time of dwelling securely. So we know these things are going to happen. There are temporary setbacks, but this isn't that God isn't in control. It's just the way the angels move. The time is not quite right for certain things, and so they have to stand still for a while, but they will certainly move the right way. One of the great signs is the growing amount of anti-Semitism across the world. This country, the UK Labour Party, has its problems. In America, the Democrats, they have their problems. Left-wing parties are 
springing up um, in the EU, and many Jews are feeling very unsafe. Much of the media is very biased against Israel, so people are continually being fed a very anti-Israel uh, news. But it is a sign of our times. We don't rejoice that there is this anti-Semitism, but God has told us, as uh, Zechariah 12 says, that all nations are going to come against Jerusalem. There is going to be a time of trouble. Israel is going to be the focus of their attention. And we can see the pressure building up even now. This is one of the many signs of the nearness of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what we have to remember is that, first of all, Jesus is going to come back to his household. There's going to be a time of judgment. There's going to be a time of preparation. There's going to be a time of transformation to immortality. So that Christ's army will be prepared in the day when God does come down against his people to go and defend Israel and to save Israel from the hand of their enemies and then establish the kingdom worldwide. So we rejoice, but we have to be warned. We must be very close to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, one of the other signs of the times is a growing rift between America and Europe. This cartoonist puts it so very well on the front cover of The Economist. 7th of July was when Trump was in um, came to visit Britain, but he also went and had meetings with NATO and with the European leaders. And this is when Miss Merkel said that, you know, we can't depend upon America. We've got to defend ourselves. We've got to pull ourselves together. And this was a real impetus to the movement for Europe to go their own way and be independent of America. we we'll just uh, enlarge it a bit more there. Increasingly, Europe's feeling uh, confident that she doesn't need America mm -hmm. and she's seeking to work with Russia instead. Now, we know from scriptures that's going to be the case. That when Nebuchadnezzar's image stands up, its feet are European and Russian, which takes them to the land of Israel. Britain and America and the other young lions are in opposition to all that. So we would expect that there is going to be this rift and increasingly, Britain is finding herself being pushed away from Europe onto the side of America. Europe, Germany, is thinking that she can depend upon Russia, Germany especially, for her supply of gas. She is busy installing a second link, a Nord Stream, which takes gas direct from Russia into Germany and although there is great controversy and Mr. Trump is very strongly against it, uh, they're pushing ahead. It's under construction as we, we shall see in a moment. But there is an intense dislike. Uh, I had a slide but I've knocked it out of the different statements made in European press in the past few months about Trump. They hate him. And so we're seeing this, this division which is as we would have expected. It's a great sign of the times. And this was uh, a headline just a fortnight ago, world upside down as EU and Russia unite against the US. And this was the occasion of the United Nations General Assembly, which Trump visited because of his uh, desire that sanctions should be placed upon those countries that deal with Iran and Europe and Russia is very much against that and unfortunately Britain at the moment is uh, on the same ilk uh, feeling that uh, they should support Iran and uh, uphold this agreement which has been an absolute failure um, but this was the headline the world is united Europe and Russia working together against America so it's thrilling news uh, we've long seen that this must be the situation and to actually see it come to pass before our eyes is something really wonderful. So let's just hone in on what the Bible uh, tells us what to expect about these latter days. And because we are in the latter days, there are so many prophecies which speak to us of the situation that we're in today. 
and Britain has an independent role from Europe. She is to be a, a worldwide trader, as we shall see, uh, waiting for uh, being able to assist the Lord Jesus, as we read in our introductory chapter, to assist the Lord Jesus when he comes back. A, a wonderful role for Britain, but outside uh, Europe. And Europe forms the beast system that Revelation talks about, and it also talks about, the in Daniel chapter 2, about the feet. And this is what we're seeing forming before our eyes, the feet of Nebuchadnezzar's image. They haven't existed in the past. They're about to exist. They're being assembled before our eyes in preparation of taking this image to the mountains of Israel. So it's clear from prophecies like Ezekiel 38 and Zechariah chapter 12 and chapter 14 and Joel chapter 3 that the, the standing up of this image is for the purpose of coming into the land of Israel to destroy Israel from being a nation but in itself to be destroyed by the little stone power of the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints. That's how Daniel saw the nations in the latter days. Made it quite clear to the king that this vision was to show the king what shall be in the latter days. And we can marry that up with the book of Revelation and what the book of Revelation, chapter 16, tells us of the situation in the last days of a dragon and a beast and a false prophet. That, that, the same things but just using different symbols. So Revelation, uh, instead of talking about iron clay feet, talks about one foot being a beast system uh, and the other foot being a dragon system and the false prophet being the eyes and the mouth that directs it all. And earlier in Revelation chapter 13, it tells us about the antecedents to the feet, the two legs, and again it tells us of a dragon power and a beast of the sea and the beast of the earth. Now what is interesting, if this image has got to come against the mountains of Israel, then it needs its armies. And we know that Russia has a very efficient army, but Europe has a very poor army. And that's what's so fascinating to see, how in recent months, Europe has been concentrating on building up itself so that it has a European army. In preparation, they don't realise it, but we know from scripture in preparation for this day of being part of that foot power that comes against Israel. So we're in this final stage. Thousands of years have gone by as the various elements of Nebuchadnezzar's image has been assembled bit by bit. We're now in these last stages. Uh, and what was different about the feet compared with the legs, was that it was not only iron, which was represented in the legs, but it was iron mixed with clay, an unstable mixture uh, and uh, one that doesn't stick together. But it was made clear that the latter-day representation of the kingdoms of men are going to be slightly different from those that have gone before because of the mixture of clay. And clay speaks to us of Adam formed out of the ground. Clay speaks of people, of democracy. And it is true, it's only in the past hundred years that people of nations have had the ability to vote and bring in elected leaders. Um, same in Russia as in Europe and this country. So this is the uniqueness of today the iron is still there, but we have the mixture of democracy with it. So, obviously, the feet are attached to legs, uh, and in the legs we have the mixture of a church, a strong church, whether in the west or the east, the uh, Russian church and the papacy, both strong powers, working with a Tsar in Russia or an emperor in Europe. So we should expect to see a similar kind of situation 
but democracy somehow being mixed in with this and not very successfully, as Daniel was told, iron and clay don't mix. And so we have in this situation that over on the east we have Russia with a strong church and a leader, Putin, who models himself on Tsar Peter the Great and who declares that Christianity is the foundation of the Russian state. What we're beginning to see in the West is the emergence of the Roman Catholic Church as a guiding power, an influencing power upon the politicians. But in both sides, there is democracy. Putin is elected, there is a Duma, not that it has much power. In Europe, next uh, May time, isn't it? There are European elections and the people will cast their votes and there will be an elective assembly. But the real power lies in the, the civil service that lies behind it, unelected people who actually move things forward. And so a wonderful um, description, this iron mixed with clay for our times. And it's interesting that the iron of the legs came to its final end. It took a long time to peter out, but finally came to an end in World War I with the last Habsburg monarch, Charles I. Then democracy was introduced, um, and uh, we now have a Western foot beginning to form. Uh, I believe that this is going to be more post-Brexit. It's uh, only in its initial stages at the moment. But we see increasingly the power of the church in the decisions that are being made in Rome, in, in Europe. And when we look at the eastern leg, we see exactly the same time period of ending with the murder of Tsar Nicholas II. And again, voting for the people was introduced after that, democracy introduced. And since the fall of communism, we've seen the eastern foot being formed, autocratic democratic, strange mixture, the rebirth of the Russian church, as uh, say Putin models himself on Peter the Great. And interestingly, all this happens at the same timetable as Israel, because it was a result of World War I that the way was opened up, the Balfour Declaration, for the Jews to go back to their land. And here we are, 70 years on, and Israel is a nation, a spoil and a prey to these two feet that are being formed before our eyes. So it's a fascinating thing to look at what is happening in Europe. And we believe that nations have got to be moved. Um, many are linked to the EU. The EU has been very successful in its push eastward, but it's gone too far. If we put on there the shading, that represented the Western Roman Empire and the blue line there, the boundaries of the Eastern Roman Empire. Then the dividing line where they met was the Balkans. And all we can do is just to extend an imaginary line upwards to give us some rough indication of where we believe the nations of the Western foot and where the nations of the Eastern foot are going to come from. And what's so interesting, as one looks, one can see how busy Russia is using all sorts of strategies, especially on the internet, false news, uh, sending out uh, all sorts of tweets and that to influence uh, election results, to move people in these eastern countries away from the EU. And uh, these are just some of the recent headlines of how Russia has been working um, uh, and how these nations are beginning to come under the influence of uh, Russia. I'm using the symbol of a, an eagle rather than the bear because that's the scriptural um, uh, representation of Rome and this is a continuation of Rome. And also this is the symbol that the Russians use themselves. On the Russian passports you have the eagle. And we can see how the Russian eagle is preparing to pull these nations eastward. 
If we look at the situation in Turkey, and the last few years Turkey has very heavily swung from the EU towards Russia, is looking to Russia for its defences, is looking for Russia for its gas supplies, is looking for uh, friendship with uh, Putin to work out what Turkey wants in Syria. So there's definite movement for Turkey to move into the eastern camp. And also there's a lot of pressure on Greece too. And the Greeks are, because of their Greek Orthodox religion, are very favourable towards Russia. And although they're long-time members of the EU, as the austerity measures that the EU have imposed upon Greece have really hit very hard, there is a feeling that uh, if push comes to shove, uh, the EU won't really come in and help us, but Putin is standing in the wings, as it were, to help Greece and absorb Greece. And uh, Romania and Bulgaria are the poorest members of the EU, and things haven't worked out for them as they expected. It hasn't been the wonderful thing joining the EU, far from it. And again, Russia is working very hard behind the scenes to influence uh, the political parties to pull them towards Russia. Uh, the same in uh, Bosnia. The Bosnian Serb leader now is Russian-leaning, thanks to the behind-the-scenes uh, influence that Russia played in the recent elections. Many of the left-wing parties in Central Europe, like Hungary, and the Czech Republic, again, they're being pulled by the cyber skills of uh, Russia to lean towards Russia. Latvia, too, has been experiencing very strong pull. Uh, she's in the EU, but the pull is there to turn to Russia. And Montenegro and Ukraine, we know the problems there. And Russia is continually behind the scenes, just causing unrest and trying to influence the people to turn to Russia. So a lot of work behind the scenes. And just last week, uh, back in Libya, again, Libya is being pulled uh, towards Russia. So these aren't fait accompli. They are uh, indicators the way things are going. We wouldn't be too surprised to see Europe and Russia dividing their spoils and a division there. But they are going to work together. They're going to be united to come against Israel. But at the moment, there is this tension between them. And uh, as Donald Tusk, the uh, EU commissioner, said uh, just uh, last week, Russia is the main threat to EU unity. So it is recognised. Right, so let's just look at Europe and the Brexit timetable. Uh, we're in this period of negotiation, which ends officially today, for the negotiations to all be wrapped up. And we know from what is happening that they're far from being wrapped up and They've been talked about having another year of uh, discussions and that uh, doesn't please the majority of the Conservatives. So uh, we're in this time period, but the EU is using this period to push ahead with its own ideas. They've got other matters other than Brexit to think about. Now this was a situation as we were at Prophecy Day. So Article 50 had been triggered in 29th of March 2017. Uh, in September of last year, Juncker had given his State of the Union speech, which was very much, we've got to stand on our own feet, we've got to have an army, we've got to strengthen the power of the euro. Macron, who had been newly elected, gave a very similar speech a fortnight later. Then on the 13th of November, just a few months after Juncker saying we've got to have our own army, the heads of the EU, barring Britain and a couple of other states, uh, met together to form a group which they call PESCO, and we'll see the meaning of that uh, in a moment, but it's to do with the military. Then at the beginning of this year, the Munich uh, Security Conference, this an annual conference in Germany, 
and the EU nations were saying what progress we've made in uh, pushing along to have our own defences. And the following month in February, uh, Merkel and Macron celebrated the 55th anniversary of the Elysee Treaty and said we got to bind ourselves together. So since then, they had their first meeting of PESCO, beginning of March, and then they set a defence budget of 13 billion. Uh, until now, defence hasn't been part of the EU budget because it's been left to every country to set its own budget. From the budget from 2021 onwards, um, defence is being budgeted in, and they've set this uh, figure of 13 billion for the United uh, Defences, as it were. Beginning of July, Austria took over the six-monthly rotating presidency that goes around from country to country. It was the turn of Austria. I uh, haven't got time to deal with that, but uh, Kurtz, the young um, leader who's a very strong Roman Catholic and is using Roman Catholic principles to uh, govern and very much supports the idea of a United States of Europe. Uh, he is now president um, of the council until uh, beginning of January. And then in July, uh, a more immediate summer money was put forward for defence cooperation uh, leading up to 2021. So they've been quite busy. And then uh, just uh, 12th of September, Juncter gave his last State of the Union speech, uh, and we'll look at that in a little detail in a moment. So PESCO, if we're cynical, it says Italian for a peach tree, which is soft on the outside and hard on the inside, which is very typical of how the EU iron and clay. But it really stands for permanent structured cooperation. And this chart really summarises it. Uh, the EU is 56% bigger than the United States, but it spends a fraction of money that the EU does, on, and the United States does, uh, on defence and has a much smaller army. But the thing is, because each nation, Britain, Germany, France, Belgium, all have their own equipment, uh, there is a vast number of weaponry systems in the EU. Uh, I don't know whether you can read it from the back, but there are 178 in the EU, whereas America only has 30. Um, Main battle tanks, 17, because there's a British tank, there's a German tank, a French tank, etc. The Americans just have one tank. They can mass produce it at much lower costs. Uh, EU has 29 different destroyers and frigates. America just has four. Uh, 20 fighter planes. America just has six. And the EU has woken up to this fact. We have to integrate. It's no good all being independent and things not working together. We've got to have one central uh, design, all work to it, all use it. And so that's what PESCO is all about, working together, uh, a united thing. So at the first meeting, which was hailed as very historic, Brexit has indeed been an accelerator the European Defence Fund, prepared in only five months since Juncker's State of the Union speech, that was the 19, 2017 one, is of unprecedented scale, both in terms of the financial means committed and the perimeter of activities envisaged. So, quite remarkable. Usually the EU takes years to get things moving. In five months, they had pushed ahead uh, and uh, were making good progress. And in June, they were setting this European defence budget, which, as I say, will kick in in 2021. But interestingly, uh, America and Britain are shut out of that. The European Defence Fund is a major plank of the bloc's strategy to boost its ability to guarantee its own security, as it frets about the threat from Russia and the United States' apparent ambivalence under President Donald Trump. To qualify for EDF funding, companies will have to be based in the European Union, have their infrastructure in the European Union, and above all, decision-making cannot be controlled by an entity based outside the European Union. 
So they made it quite clear that this is a European project and Britain and America are pushed out. And one of the sore points for Mrs May is that Britain has invested a lot of money in the Galileo, Galileo project of putting up satellites so that Europe had its own GPS system and wasn't reliant upon America. And Britain has put most of the uh, research and developments and a lot of money into that. And now she's being told you won't be able to use the data because you'll be outside the EU, you won't be a member. And so Mrs May, I don't know whether it was light-hearted or not, I don't think it was, um, because uh, they're investigating whether it's possible for Britain to have her own system. And Juncta, in one of his meetings, rather scathingly said, you know, an individual country can't afford all these satellites. You have to be a big body like we are. Overlooking the fact that, of course, little tiny Israel, much smaller than Britain, has its own satellite systems. In fact, it made good sense if Britain and Israel got together and had their own GPS system. But we shall see. So, 12th of September, a month ago, Juncta gave his last State of the Union speech. He's retiring um, up in May when the EU elections take place. So this is his last speech. And the theme was the hour of Europe's sovereignty. So this was the aim. We are going to be a sovereign state, a one Europe, a United States of Europe. And what he said was, the world has not stopped turning, it's more volatile than ever. The external challenges facing our continent are multiplying by the day. There can therefore be not a moment's respite in our efforts to build a more united Europe. The world today needs a strong and united Europe. I will continue to work day and night over the next months to see the European Defence Fund and the Permanent Structured Cooperation in Defence become fully operational. By next year, we should also address the international role of the euro. The euro is 20 years old, 20 years young, and has already come a long way, despite its critics. That is why, before the end of the year, the Commission will present initiatives to strengthen the international role of the euro. The euro must become the face and instrument of a new, more sovereign Europe. And we must improve our ability to speak with one voice when it comes to our foreign policy. What irks the Europeans, and you can't blame them, they only get about 5% of their fuel from America, but everything is priced in dollars. So it all has to go through exchange rates and paid for in dollars. So Europe is saying we want to use the, Europe, or the euro as our means of payment, not only for fuel, but also for aircraft. They're all paid for in dollars. Um, so this is what they're wanting to do as part of the initiative of making Europe stand upon its feet. And they want to be able to speak with one voice on foreign policy. So instead of Britain saying what she wants and Germany saying what she wants, uh, they want to have one common um, entity. They have it in a small extent, but they want to strengthen it. So that's the aim, that's the drive for Europe to become more sovereign, to become more united, more independent of America uh, so that she uh, is weaned away from American influence and can then work with Russia. So what we see is the forming either feet or beasts and dragons and false prophets. Um, and what's interesting is how they cooperate. Germany, especially in France, very keen to cooperate where they can with Russia. They don't agree with a lot that Russia does, but they feel that it will be much safer to have Russia as a friend than an enemy. And it's also interesting how the papacy is more and more having an influence upon what happens, what takes place in the politics of Europe. And of course Putin and the Pope have been good friends and again uh, many visits uh, and there is this 
interesting linkage going on behind the scenes. So if you just look at the uh, false prophet and the Europe, there is an organisation called Europe Infos, which is uh, coming together of the Catholic Church and the European Union and the Jesuit European Social Centre. They send out a newsletter every two months, fascinating one, this last one. Uh, there's one due to come at any moment. Um, this one was Catholics engaging in politics, urging Catholics, Pope Francis was saying that uh, we should engage more uh, in politics. And it is interesting how the Pope definitely backs uh, an increasingly European um, state. Uh, he said that uh, the countries of Europe will act if they recognise one truth. Either Europe becomes a federal community or it will no longer count for anything in the world. And federal is to act together. So he's saying if Europe's going to get anywhere, it has to work as one. And that's what Article 17 says, that the European Union has an obligation to consult with the churches. Interestingly, with the uh, Austrian presidency, there was a church delegation that met with the Austrian presidency to put their viewpoint. And for the past uh, 20 years, this has been happening. Every time there's a new president comes along, every six months, the churches get together and they put their viewpoint uh, uh, to him. And one of the things they were putting to him this time on the subject of Brexit, the church representatives represented, re emphasised the need for efforts to prevent a hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. A visible frontier, church representatives said, that jeopardises the common achievements of reconciliation and peace and divide citizens on both sides must be avoided. So very much against having a hard border. So that's interesting, they picked, uh, there was about six things they had, and one of them was this hard border between uh, Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic, and they didn't want that. And interestingly, um, when Tusk talked about Russia is the main threat to European EU unity, he was speaking at a conference entitled The Role of the Catholic Church in the Process of European Integration. And this is an annual event, and this was year 18. So every year for 18 years, there has been this conference on the role of the Catholic Church in the process of European integration. So there is a lot of behind the scenes work and influence. A lot of the leaders are Roman Catholic themselves and are very much uh, in favour of what the Pope stands for uh, and want his help to unite Europe together. Because it's very difficult to unite French and Germans and Dutch and all the rest of it. It needs some overarching power. And Europe recognises that the churches have that power if they say we've got to bind together, then they will bind together. So just a little example of uh, Russia and Germany. This is the Nord Stream that I alluded to. The first twin pipeline was put down in 2011, 2012. And now a second um, pipeline is being built. Uh, this will obviously double the capacity. And it makes Germany a very strong player within the EU because energy is the very basis of how countries work. And Germany is making herself the central distribution point for Russian gas throughout the rest of Europe. Some of it comes to Britain, a small percentage. Trump very much against this. A lot of the European states are actually against it because it cuts out transit fees that they have received in the past when Russian pipelines go across their country. Because this is going down the seabed, nobody gets any transit fees. There is a little problem at the moment. Denmark owns the little remote island in the middle of nowhere, and she hasn't yet given permission for the second pipeline uh, to go around the island. Obviously the first one did, but she's raising objections. But 
they've said, well, no problems, we'll just go around the islands, and so, um, you know, Denmark can't stop us. And in fact, they started laying the pipeline from the Russian end in September and from the German end in October. So although the actual little route around there hasn't been sorted out, they've already uh, laying the pipe and plan to be completed by the end of next year for Operation 2020. So this other was just uh, from uh, Russian paper Sputnik. Europe seeking to boost ties with Russia and Turkey apart or away from without the US. Uh, and this was interesting because Turkey has uh, been very much against the things of uh, Europe, but has chosen to um, change a little bit. And Merkel gave a state visit to Erdogan uh, a few months uh, in August time. And uh, there was a lot of opposition to this visit. But he is an opportunity, says Erdogan, and he sees that if he can get influence on Germany, that will help him in gaining power because he, uh, the, the Turkish currency is losing a lot of its value. It is being very weakened. Now, just uh, a short bit. I mean, we don't normally talk about assumed murders, but it is the background to it that has just in the past few days come out, which I thought was so interesting. So he was, we put it in the past, um, a Saudi Arabian journalist, but he has Turkish ancestry in his background. He was a high school friend of bin Laden, and uh, he has supported bin Laden. But he's been a big supporter of the Muslim Brotherhood, which seeks to replace Israel with an Islamic State. And uh, the Muslim Brotherhood was initially supported by Saudi Arabia, but now has been banned by Saudi Arabia and by Egypt uh, and by Syria. In fact, the Muslim Brotherhood is only now supported by Turkey and Qatar. So this chap was exiled because of his uh, disagreements with the especially the new crown prince in Saudi Arabia and what he was doing, and especially his advances to make friends with Israel. So he had to hop it and uh, was residing in America. He was in Turkey because he wants to get married again and he needed his divorce papers to enable him to marry his Turkish fiancée um, when he disappeared. And what we know is that on the morning of the 2nd, in the very early hours, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 15 Saudi high-ups came on private jets and landed at Istanbul airport and departed that night uh, in various jets. And Khashoggi is, cannot be found. Now, what is interesting is that Ergadan is making full use of this situation. He can see there is an advantage. If they can come up with some whitewash that will uh, appease uh, the West in their antagonism of what Saudi Arabia has done, then that will help him because Britain and America want to do trade with Saudi Arabia and they've got outstanding contracts. It's a, a little gold mine for both of them and they very much want to do trade with Saudi Arabia. So if some compromise can be put that it was a mistake or something went wrong and so the whole thing can be washed onto the carpet, then that will stand him in good stead with the West, with Britain and with America. It will also stand him in good stead with Saudi Arabia. And now, at the moment, Saudi Arabia uh, is backing the Kurds in Syria, and Turkey is very much against the Kurds. He wants them wiped out. And so, again, if Saudi Arabia has to be indebted to Turkey, probably the price will be, let's uh, don't support the Kurds, let me wipe them out. We shall just have to see. 
It's incidents like this that can alter balance of power. At the moment, it seems it's going to make it very difficult for Britain, America and Saudi Arabia, but we shall just have to see how the situation turns out. Last Sunday was also the um, Bavarian elections, which Bavaria is the most important of the German states. This is where the main powerhouse of Germany is. And uh, a unique situation there, the Christian Social Union, which was the dominant uh, party in Bavaria, is twinned to Merkel's uh, Christian Democratic Union. But the elections went very poorly. The uh, CSU lost their majority. They got to find a coalition party. They've always had uh, uh, sufficient votes to uh, rule without a coalition. And the other party that uh, suffered badly was the Social Democratic Party. Um, and they've lost a lot of votes. And it's parties like the Greens and the AFD which have uh, boosted themselves. And the AFD have now won enough seats. You have to get at least 5% of the votes to get seats in the um, Bavarian section of the uh, parliament, German parliament. So they now have seats. Now, it's the AFD that are linked in Austria. They are the coalition partner for the Austrians. It's a party that is very opposed to migration, very opposed to Muslims coming in, very much wants... Uh, uh, a Catholic um, Europe and um, to stand on its own feet uh, and so it's interesting how these parties are rising in power and the traditional parties are falling. Now this is going to cause problems for Merkel because uh, these people have lost 16 seats so in the coalition which they have with Merkel uh, there'll be 16 seats down and in the other elections in Germany uh, Merkel's party hasn't been doing very well, so she's been weakened. And it's interesting, she's been weakened just at this critical time in Brexit talks, when, you know, we could do with a strong Germany, um, but she has been weakened. Who will take over if she's forced to resign, which a lot of people are saying she'll have to step down? Well, this uh, Karl Theodor Gutenberg is still waiting in the wings. He used to be the defence minister. He had to stand down because of plagiarism with his uh, university um, treaties. Um, but he is a man that would transform not only Germany, but the whole of Europe. He's a very popular figure, uh, and a lot of people would love to see him back. He's a real aristocrat, as you can see from his name, which I've had to shorten. So, Brexit. Uh, cartoonists love Brexit, don't they? These, uh, the Mrs May has really suffered at their hands. And only if you know about Banks's picture will this make sense, but if you know about Banks's picture being shredded after it being sold for a record amount, then this cartoon will make sense with Boris rejoicing in the back when her Chequers plan was uh, torn to shreds by the EU. This is today's cartoon in the Telegraph, which, uh, when you get there, you'll see the subtlety of it. And so what is the answer? Who knows? So, we're in this timetable, and I say today was supposed to be, but uh, they're talking about extending it. There's different solutions. Chequers obviously is dead, but there's Canada plus, 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 Norwegian model and that. But the interesting thing is, what's the primary cause of all the problems? It's religion, pure and simple. It's that border between uh, Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic. Northern Ireland just has a majority of Protestants but fiercely loyal, those Protestants regard themselves as British, whereas the Roman Catholics in Northern Ireland regard themselves as Irish. Interestingly, our second hymn, the tune was Irish. Um, that was the name of the tune. Um, that's by the by. So there is strong pressure. Ireland, Southern Ireland, would love to absorb Northern Ireland and have Ireland united. 
and they saw their opportunity in Brexit by proposing that Northern Ireland should remain in the EU and the border between the Northern Ireland and Britain should run along the Irish Channel. But of course Britain won't have that, she's very proud of Northern Ireland and the majority of the Northern Irish don't want to be part of Southern Ireland. So there is this, this great problem and how it can be solved. It can only be solved if there's goodwill on both sides and there are technological means of solving the problem so that there isn't a hard border. But it is so interesting that it, it basically comes down to a religious divide that is causing the problem. And of course Mrs May's government is being supported by the DUP, which is the Protestant party in the north, and they're going to have nothing to do with anything that will uh, appear to bind Northern Ireland to the Irish Republic. So it would seem that the angels are very busy trying to persuade the British government not to have anything to do with the EU. Mrs May desperately wants to be part of the EU, basically that she is a Remainer at heart. Um, but the angels are trying to show that no way can Britain have one foot in the EU. They've got to break. Uh, and that's what we hope will happen. So, time is flying on, as it always does. But uh, just very briefly then about Tyre and Tarshish. There are a number of passages, uh, some of them listed there, which are clearly latter day which show us that there is to be a Tyre Tarshish power in existence. Probably the most uh, famous passage is the one we use so often is in Ezekiel chapter 38, which talks about the merchants of Tarshish at the latter days when Israel is invaded. So there clearly has to be a Tarshish power. And we read by way of introduction from chapter 23 of Isaiah. And again, a fascinating insight into the downfall of Tyre and how its own feet would carry her afar off. They would go to Kittim and find no rest there. It had to go further afield. And it's interesting to plot the mercantile powers uh, which Tyre represented in the Old Testament times for uh, quite a, a number of years. Don't take these dates too closely because there's always a build-up time and a, a slow-down time. But it was uh, Alexander the Great that conquered Tyre in 332, moved down into Egypt and built Alexandria, and that became the main mercantile centre. We know in New Testament times, the Apostle Paul uh, went on ships of, from Alexandria. But that, that came to an end roughly 700 AD and the centre of maritime power and wealth moved to Venice. And Venice prospered for about 500 years but came to a decline, arguments and that. And Genoa you know, then took the lead for just a short period of time. And then that again came to an end as the Spanish and Portuguese, um, Portuguese uh, explorers uh, took over and explored over to America and Lisbon became the centre of maritime power. And then that was uh, queried and challenged by the Dutch and Amsterdam then took the seas and in running in parallel London defeated the Spanish Armada but slowly built up her strength so that she became the dominant power and has been so for the past three or four hundred years. So her feet shall carry her afar off. And we believe that that's where the latter-day uh, Tyrian Tarshish power, that is where it resides. And in this chapter, it tells us that in the latter days, this Tarshish power, after 70 years of... Um, uh, of uh, down treading, as it were, of being forgotten, it's going to come together in power. And God's going to visit Tyre. She's going to turn to her higher, commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world on the face of the earth. But her merchandise shall be, uh, and her hire shall be holiness to Yahweh. 
It shall not be treasured up, for her merchandise shall be for them that dwell before Yahweh, and eat sufficiently, and durable clothing. So that's a picture of a, a, a Britain helping Israel and helping Yahweh, the returned Lord Jesus, to help bring the Jews back when Jesus has destroyed the Gogan forces and the call is for the Jews to come back. And the wealth that Britain is about to build up will be used in that service. So we're in this stage of committing fornication with all kingdoms of the world upon the earth. And that's what Britain is setting out to do. And only Britain fits the clues. Uh, we know Tarshish was to the west of Israel because uh, Jonah went to Joppa to get a ship to Tarshish. We know the early Britons were descended from Javan and Tarshish was descended from Javan. We know that Britain was the ancient source of silver, iron, tin and lead, which uh, Ezekiel 27 talks about, coming from Tarshish. And she is in the spirit of Tyre. And she has that commonwealth, those young independent lions that Ezekiel 38 talks about. Only Britain fits all those clues. And she is a leading merchant power, biggest source of international bank lending and cross-border lending and handles two-thirds of all the world trade, is handled by London, not seen in London, but from the centre of London, the shipping, the insurance, the uh, lending, uh, it, that's where it all takes place. Now, what Brexit will allow Britain to do is to expand her <coughs> military, her uh, navy, and her merchant shipping uh, because she wants to be a trading power. Uh, at the moment, the British representatives are going around the world drumming up future trade. And so Liam Fox has been going from country to country. And in fact, uh, one of our members attended a meeting recently in London, part of his business, where seven of these ambassadors have spent the last two years drumming up trade for Britain. And what it needs are ships. And there was a 16-page supplement in the Times this week uh, all about maritime economy. I'll uh, just pull one article. There are lots of interesting articles. But £47 billion is the estimated gross value of um, the mar marine um, opportunities to the United, to the King, United Kingdom and 95% of Britain's trade is carried in the seas. Um, the blue economy is maritime in all its aspects, whether fish farming, shipping, uh, tidal power, uh, wind farms in the sea. It's a huge growing market and Britain wants to have her share of it. So we see uh, the countries of Sheba and Dedan working with Israel and Britain and the merchants, the Commonwealth countries, working in this area and working with Israel. And middle of this year, Prince William went to Jordan and to Israel. Uh, he had a very successful trip and it made a deep impression on him. And when he came back, he pledged to make peace in the Middle East his lifelong ambition. And what's so interesting is how Britain has keyed into Israel as an important market. Um, and just in this uh, first half of this year, uh, Britain's exports to Israel have, are 75% up on what they were um, for the first half of 2017. Trade is certainly booming. And the UK is uh, Israel's largest trading destination for Israeli goods after the United States. And again, what is so interesting is that the close but often complicated relations between Israel and the United Kingdom have grown much closer. Um, among the factors contributing to the new trends according to exports, experts are Britain's planned withdrawal from the European Union and the shift in international focus in the Middle East from the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to the global war on terror. Israel sees Britain as her ally. She's very hampered with Britain being in the EU. She's looking forward to Britain being outside the EU 
they can do so much more together. And one of the 10 key countries that Britain has targeted for new bilateral trade agreements is Israel because of what she has there. So that's the end of the slides. I'm sorry it's taken so long. But uh, there are so many things which should encourage us. There's so much has happened. We are at the edge of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And though sometimes it appears there are setbacks, we can be quite sure that the angels will ensure that God's purpose is worked out. So I'll just put that up if you want to keep up to date with all the things that are happening. Um, there's about 12 pages three or four times a week in the Stuart. It just comes pouring out. There's so much happening. And there's a kind of little uh, summary of the things which I feel are interesting and what I use when I'm writing milestones. So if you want to go on the mailing list, just drop me an email. Thank you.